Welcome to Leadership Seminar Series. We're going to have a great presentation today. We've got Dr. Fabio Gandor, and he's going to share lessons learned on innovation. He's got a great story to share, and as you listen to his story, and he's going to use a lot of examples from IBM, um, he's going to go through and he's living this mission about creating, about innovating, about delivering, about collaborating, about world-changing solutions, and he's got some great examples. And so as you're listening to that, think about IBM a little bit, think about the examples, but think about also what did it take for him to go make these things a reality. Those are lessons learned that we need to pull out. So there'll be some great talk there. The other thing is Fabio shares his story. He lives this. He's got doctor in front of his name, but there's an MD and there's a PhD. And as we talked and listened to him talk, he's still learning and he's still growing. And he's led himself, and he's built an organization of engineers and scientists that are creating some really cool things. So he's living lifelong learning, lifelong engagement. He's known as the chief scientist, right? He's known as the top 10 influencers in the field of IT. He's known as an innovation evangelist. That's why he's here. He's going to share some stories. And as he shares, he's known as a good friend. And I think you're going to share a story how you got here. But he's been a good friend with Bob who brought him here. And my sense is you're probably a good friend to a lot of folks. And that's part of being a leader. So without further ado, Fabio. You are not moving to the next one. He's the IT guy. I am not. I broke it. <laughs> ben will fix this in the video. Ben does miracles. Let me see here where we should go. Here we go. are. Yeah. The less technology way. <laughs> <laughs> they know I'm not the IT guy. All right. Thank you very much, Bob, and the rest of the leaders in University of Central Florida. Uh, thank you, Tim, for your kind presentation. I'm really glad to be here um, for a number of reasons, OK? First of all, when we say USA down there in Brazil, a lot of people think about Florida. So Florida is the compelling state for most of my Brazilian country fellows to go, OK? And if I have some of these Brazilian country fellows around here, please do not raise your hand, OK? <laughs> yeah. But they can confirm what I'm saying. And when we say Florida, Orlando is the place to be, all right? So there is a kind of geographic synchronism between my country this country, this state, and this city, OK? So given this alignment of the stars, I am in the right place, <laughs> OK? As Tim said, I work for IBM. I've been in IBM in the last 22 years. But I took care enough, you know, to do not become a regular IBM. I don't even use a blue suit, <laughs> OK? I will not talk about IBM things here. I'm going to talk about science, technology to solve complex problems in a developing country like Brazil and many other Latin American countries, OK? Uh, I'm going to keep the cameraman pretty tired because I walk all the time, <laughs> OK? Uh, I will try as much as possible to be interactive. I love to breathe this air in uh, the academic atmo atmosphere because it may have some artery dilation effect, you see, which enhances the diameter of my coronary arteries and brings more oxygen to the brain, okay? So whenever I get into an academic environment, I'm used it to deep breathe, you know? and absorb this kind of side effect of being here. Well, 
Now, let me go through some obvious things. English is not my mother language. Okay. In Brazil, we speak. Oh, great. In <laughs> Buenos Aires, it's not our capital city, please. <laughs> okay. By the way, what is the capital city of Brazil? Brasilia. Brasilia. Great. You guys are doing very well. High scores. Okay. Uh, and I have this kind of nasty foreign accent, which, by the way, is nothing new in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, if I say something wrong, you please feel free to correct me, all right? I'm used to make a joke saying that by working in technology in the Latin American countries in parallel, we are, we are building a new language called Esportunglish, <laughs> which is a mix of Spanish, Portuguese, and English. Uh, the title I've selected to be here in the Eli 2 presentation was a kind of uh, compelling question. A vanguard research lab in a developing country. Does it make sense? Okay. Why I've selected this title? Because when I first approached the top sharks in IBM Corporation and I said, hey guys, what about having a research lab, IBM Research Division official presence in this exotic tropical land called Brazil? You see, the guy who was hearing me said, does it make sense? Okay, which was a fair answer because I, at this very moment, you see, avoided something terrible in the big corporation, indifference. You know, he might have well said, oh, cool, and never touched this again. But when he asked me, does it make sense? I said, well, now you challenged me. I'm going to explain for you why this may make sense, okay? So this is part of my major topic here. But my flight plan will cover other things, okay? I plan to talk about friendship. I plan to talk about developing countries, innovation, then go to something more regular, the creation of the lab. Okay, then I'm going to show you some intriguing slides. I plan to dip into some ongoing project and the results we got so far. Then I'm going to talk some about something that nobody will understand anything, but this is part of the presentation. Okay, <laughs> then I'm going to go through some mathematic intriguing and scaring calculus. Okay, and then it's done. <laughs> All right. Well, this is my flight plan. So... Orlando Control Tower, I ask for your permission to take off. <laughs> Memories. This is an organization called Institute of the Americas, created based on the vision, the wisdom of uh, an American citizen who happens to be the U.S. ambassador in several uh, Latin American countries. When he got retired, uh, retired, he created this Institute of the Americas in La Jolla, California. It doesn't ex exist uh, yet, okay? Unfortunately, Ambassador Paul Booker passed away in a dramatic, uh, uh, with a dramatic disease. He got out of a sudden a brain cancer. And it was exactly in this organization where I first met my good friend Bob Rich, working here with you guys. And Bob has been kind enough to invite me to come here. It was interesting because last time I saw Bob was about 10 years ago. And, I, and when I met him uh, yesterday, okay, in the hotel, I got the feeling that last time we, we were together was a week ago, okay? So these are things that the technology cannot create but can help, you see, making human connections. And by the way, if I had to stop here, I would say technology makes sense if and only if it works, you see, in favor of the mankind, in favor of a human being. And now you may ask me, but which kind of human being? Anyone. Okay? It can be the highest, richest executive, okay, in the 20th floor in a big 
corporate building in Manhattan, but it can also be, you see, a teacher, okay, lost in a far, in a distant place in the middle of the rainforest in Brazil. Each of those human beings have their technology needs. Okay, so you guys, get out of this engineering school or get out of any of the, the schools you are attending in the University of Central Florida with this firm decision. I'm going to put technology to work, okay, in favor of a human being. Could be a notebook, could be a nuclear reactor, okay, whatever, or a skyrocket, okay. Anyway, if you do so, you will feel yourself very good. And I raised the flag when I joined at IBM 22 years ago, okay, and once in a while, I understand that the sales guy may get into kind of desperation when he or she tried to push a technology to a customer and I say, mm -mm, I do not agree, okay? However, at this time, I am the chief scientist, okay? So they have kind of abide by some of my rules, okay? Well, two drops of me. And me starts with this I here, but this I does not mean I, Fabio. I want to explain for you guys, because whenever somebody says Fabio Gendor is graduated in medicine, okay, and switched to computer science, okay, I can use a technology here to see what's going on in your minds, okay? It does not hurt. I put it here. You know what you're thinking. You thought this guy may have killed somebody. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> that's not the case, fortunately. I went through uh, the, a, a medical school in a university, which at that time, long ago, uh, early 70s, was uh, executing an experimental educational plan to rescue the meaning of the word university, which means universal knowledge. Okay. Uh, this experimental plan had a lot of practical consequences, but the most important of them, at least for me at that time, was the fact that although attending the medical school, I could also attend areas in other schools, okay? So over the six years period of the medical school, I did some interesting things. You see, I attended areas such as cartoons, a lot of psychology areas, okay? Uh, but the field which attracted me the most was mathematics. So I went pretty far in the field of mathematics. I got out of the medical school with a good foundation in mathematics. Went to do my training in pediatric surgery in Canada. Pediatric surgery is where you learn how to cut children. <laughs> okay? But relax, it's easy. Then, you <laughs> see, you connect them ar already white to white, yellow to yellow, red to red, and it's done, <laughs> okay? Well, in this residence training period, you see, preparing uh, a kind of complex case to be published, okay? I got to a small discovery in mathematics in the field of statistics related to congenital malformations, which was my field of dedication at that time, okay? So I mentioned that to my surgeon in chief at that time, Dr. Harvard Birdmore, up there in the Toronto Sick Kids Hospital. And he said, Brésilien, because he was out of uh, Quebec, Brésilien, I cannot understand what you say, but you say with s in a so convincing way that I believe, okay? <laughs> so mention that in the medical publication, and later on, you can explore this, okay? So I got back to Brazil, started working as a surgeon, and started to, started to explore this finding with paper and pencil, okay? And out of a sudden, a colleague came to visit me and said, Fabio, you need to use a computer. Long story short, he inoculated the virus of computing in me. I got a very serious computational septicemia and I died. <laughs> okay, I decided to get back to the school to get a PhD 
in computer science up there in the University of Stanford in California, okay? Well, before that, I went through a period I was known as the crazy doctor uh, who was able to manage computers. How do I see that today? I went from an I to a T, okay? Today, we say we cannot be I-shaped anymore. We have to be T-shaped. What the hell does it mean, guys? <laughs> an I person is a person that understands only one area as deep as possible and as narrow as possible to a point where this I-shaped person will end up knowing everything about anything. Okay, but it's going to get specialized, specialized, deep, 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 deep. Okay, you take yourself to a limit. Today, we need T-shaped people. T-shaped people means a person who knows deep one culture, deep one discipline, and deep one system, but can also cope with many other cultures, many other disciplines and many other systems, all right? And it was so amazing what has happened with me here at the University of Central Florida because of my good friend Bob Rich, which created a very dense agenda in which I had opportunity to talk with a broad variety of people, okay, from many cultures, many disciplines, and many systems, all right? So you folks, go through your educational process becoming as T-shaped as possible, all right? Well, this is Brazil. I'm using to call this slide Brazil for gringos, <laughs> okay? Because it has a summary of uh, interesting facts. Things like Brazil holds 15% of the world's fresh water supply. It's a lot, okay? Brazil has 22% of the world's arable land and only 17% of this land is really farmed, okay? And only 1% of this 17% has been farmed for biofuels. Why I put this number here? Because back then when I was explaining, trying to convince my bosses that it would make sense to have a research lab in Brazil, there was an argument going on here in the U.S. saying, oh, Brazil is just damaging the soil, planting sugar cane to make ethanol. As you guys may know, the cars in Brazil have flex fuel engines. I can put in any proportion gasoline and ethanol. And the car system will recognize what are the adjustments that has been, must be made you see in the combustion process, okay? So I decided to put this thing here, this 1% to say, hey, wait a minute, guys. The lobby may be trying to push an information to you which is not exactly correct. And then I added also some interesting facts here. For instance, Brazil is the third consuming country in cosmetics and soft drinks. Okay? In terms of number one, you folks are unbeatable. <laughs> you are the number one, okay? We are the fourth country in terms of consumption of chocolate. In this topic, you are also golden medalists, <laughs> okay? We have 29 factories brewing, uh, to brew beer, okay? And you cannot beat us in this topic, okay? By the way, I don't know if you've been following the news, uh, Global Brazilian Company just acquired Anheuser-Busch, okay? So the beer you guys are drinking now, <laughs> you see, are made by a Brazilian brewer, okay? <laughs> well, what is the beauty of digging deep in a developing country like Brazil or any other developing country? The beauty is because innovation down there is a question of survival. You see, look at how innovative was this solution here. Okay, the point is, this solution, although very innovative, by the way, the guy solved his problem. 
he had to communicate and use the hands, okay? <laughs> so the thing he found here was one of those very popular rubber bands, okay, that do exist in any office, and here he is in a very innovative attitude. However, this thing cannot be transforming, transformed in money. It's a non-transformable innovation. You cannot monetize it, okay? Now, let's see another thing which is also innovative because it's a question of survival. This is a regular bike used to deliver uh, small goods you see in food, by food stores or something like that, okay? Think about this bike and think about this holding surface. If I put something here, what's going to happen, okay? Basic physics. This is the wheel which gives direction to the bike and this is the wheel which gives traction to the bike. Okay, if I put a weight in on top of the front wheel, the front axle, I'm going to create a force in this direction. Therefore, you see a momentum in the other direction in the opposite direction, in, in the opposite sense. Okay, what is the result? Driving this bicycle, it's a mess because I'm uh, 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 I'm increasing. You see the contact between this wheel, which is a direction wheel, and the soil, and the traction, you see, it's going to be kind of lost because there is an opposite force in the other side, okay? Uh, well, anyway, keep, people keep manufacturing this kind of bike, the bike. Look at this. This gentleman here does not hold a PhD in physics, okay? However, he has been, you know, innovative enough to engineer this bike here. He, uh, you, you know, look at this. The colors are different. He may have taken this part here from another bike with a different color, okay? In a way that now the bigger load is in the back wheel, in the traction wheel, and the forces are opposite then in that first bike. Here, I increase the friction, okay, with the ground, I improve the traction, and I release the, 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 the wheel, you see, uh, uh, for direction purposes, okay? Have you seen this bike around here? No, no, okay? This is an innovation made because the gentleman here has to survive. It's a question of survival. It's a compelling need to make something which is going to make his life easier. Of course, at this time, you may ask me, is this thing here patented? Of course not, but it's monetizable. <coughs> you can make money out of this kind of innovation. Well, with that in mind and considering the IBM Research Division, um, which up to 2010 had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight labs in the world, all of them in the Northern Hemisphere, I raised the flag, let's do a lab in Brazil. We became the ninth lab, and after us, three more labs came to life. Ireland, Afri Australia, and by the end of last year, Africa. Okay, and this effort, the creation of Ireland, Africa, and Australia, was based in the good results we got in Brazil in the last two years and a half, okay? Our lab was announced by mid-2010. We, what we do there is mostly based on the existing disciplines in the IBM Research Division. We cannot change this, okay? This is a tradition in IBM, but we have made a very clever selection on which areas we would work on, which will be our focus areas. And our focus areas are smarter natural resources. Forget the smarter. This is smarter is something enforced in my slide by the marketing people, okay? As they pay my salary or they help to pay my salary, I have to abide by their rules. Do you agree? Uh, sure, yeah, okay? So natural resources with emphasis in oil and gas because of the recent wells discovered 
by Petrobras and the pre-South uh, offshore platforms in Brazil, okay? So natural resources with emphasis in oil and gas, human systems with emphasis in mega events, okay? Uh, because of the World Cup and um, the Olympics Games, which is gonna happen in Brazil in 2014 and 2016, you may be asking yourselves why the mosquito is here to illustrate this slide. It's because we have to tell to the visitors what a mosquito is. Mosquitoes usually does not speak English, okay? So they have to know. Then we have uh, a focus in service system um, with emphasis in quality, and I'm gonna talk about services to you later on. And the fourth area is uh, smarter devices with emphasis in low complexity circuitry because this represents an important um, amount of money in our uh, import trade balance, okay? Now, these titles here are nice, cool, but the good thing in this slide are those four statements. We put in place this lab to perform science as a business. If you feel science as a business is an aggressive statement, I can put a kind of relief word here. Science as a business enabler, okay? Just to make it a little bit more, you know, comfortable. But the science as a business is something, it's a kind of science which has to create a positive impact in the business of its sponsor. We, we work in collaborative research. So far, I admit candidly that we've not been very collaborative yet, but this is in our bylaws. We uh, have multi-centric facilities, Sao Paulo, Rio, and whenever it's gonna be necessary, even Orlando, Florida, okay, by some reason. And we will use innovation as a profitable process, pretty much inspired in that bike you just seen. Well, we not only look for T-shaped people, but we also want to form T-shaped people, okay? So people to work in the natural resources group will be dedicated to mostly these four areas and they have to be skilled in these academic areas. Math, computer, computer science, high performance computing, data visualization. Those are the scientists we're gonna hire to work in this area. Likewise, in the human systems, we are working in these areas, collaboration, individualization, intelligent infrastructure, social and economical development, and intelligent management. This area of human systems, out of a sudden, got a major focus in accessibility, and we redefined the, 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 the word accessibility, okay? We are considering illiteracy a kind of unaccessible situation, okay? Um, not only uh, limitations to movement, blindness, okay? Hear impairment, the traditional uh, 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 ways to classify accessibility, we decided to be slightly innovative in that. Because think about this, a person has the legs. He or she can walk. He's looking for a restroom, but he cannot read the sign restroom. Okay, because he or she are illiterate. Okay, this person is as if he or she were paralyzed, although the legs work pretty well, you know. She, uh, this person that is, is not totally equipped with accessibility tools because it's illiterate, okay? Well, those are uh, the professionals we are hiring to work here. Um, likewise, in service systems group, okay, we are devoted to these areas, analytics, cloud, social network, coordination, blah, 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 and we are hiring this kind of professional here. Keep in mind that all those slides are, to are here to illustrate how T-shaped we want people working with us, okay? Again, a deep knowledge, as deep as possible, in one culture, okay? One area, one system, 
but also willing to enhance the vision of the world, okay? And finally, microelectronics. We are working in packaging. We have a very interesting project in microfluidics. If I have time, I'm gonna give you some details about this, okay? And we are now trying to apply nanotech in the petroleum exploration area, also in the area of the pre-salt. Those are the professionals we've been looking for, okay? Uh, by the way, again, the minimum academic credential is PhD. Postdocs are highly requested and welcomed. One site is this one, where is my office, okay, in Sao Paulo, and the other site is this one in Rio de Janeiro, bordering the Guanabara Bay, okay? If by any chance you guys go to that part of this, plan this planet, I will be more than happy to welcome you uh, visiting us. Just let me know in advance. All right, what is behind this plan? Complexity. The world, the global world, is more and more complex. Complexity is raising. You see, every day, all right? And we have to create some methods, some methodology to approach complexity. To do so, we evaluate complexity in two angles over time. The man, its environment over time, and if I can illustrate my point, just to show, uh, just to go to a conclusion, you see, let's think about what the man is doing with him or, he, uh, or herself we are getting to a complex evolution to a point where technology can replicate a man. This is a famous new which came up a couple of we weeks ago. Uh, this, guy, uh, this guy, an, engin an electronic engineer, has created a sophisticated robot, okay, uh, mimicking the human physiology, and the face of the, the robot is a copy of his own face, okay? Uh, I strongly suspect, he, he did not confess, but I strongly suspect he's trying to build a replicant. Okay, I don't know, you are too young to have seen this movie. Yeah, okay, Harrison Ford. Okay, about replicants. All right, go in the internet and you're gonna find it, okay? Well, in the environment, the variable I selected here to illustrate how things are getting more and more complex is energy, okay? Pretty soon, we're gonna have a new kind of consumer of energy. So far, the bigger consumers of energy are the households and the industry. Pretty soon, we're gonna have cars, okay? Cars will become a big consumer of energy and therefore, we need to find creative and innovative way to produce energy clean energy as much as possible, okay? Brazil has been invaded by eolic energy plants, okay? Notably in the Atlantic Rim. Well, we do not have many methodologies to cope with complexity, all right? And I don't know if I still have time adorning the surface of this planet to create a new methodology. So I better try to refine existing one. For the moment, the one that I've been using is summarized, summarized in this picture. It's written in Portuguese, but here the summary is in English. The methodology to approach complexity is 3S plus 3P. 3S, whenever you see something complex, Keep in mind that that complexity has its own strategy. The complexity has a strategy. So try to understand the strategy of the complexity. This strategy does work on top of a structure. So the complexity has a structure, okay? Try to identify this structure and this structure operates based on a system. 
okay? So try to decipher the system which runs the structure to a given strategy in a complex situation. Now, plus the three S, try to see who are the three P's. What's the purpose of the complexity? Complexity does not happen neither at random nor for free. You know, not uh, neither for the intention of God. Oh my goodness, this is so complex. You see, I have to pray to solve this complexity. No, 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 no. All right. Try to understand the purpose. This purpose operates through a process. This process may be visible or hidden, and it affects people in front of the complexity or behind the complexity. Okay, those are uh, the variables in the model we've been using to operate this recently installed IBM Research Lab down there in Brazil, okay? Of course, each of those dimensions can be unfolded in many other dimensions, but if I do so, this slide would be too much complex, all right? Think about something that Looks like to be simple. Social business is a very fashionable word. When you go map the social business, you get into this slide. Look what, at how complex the social business is becoming, okay? If you segment, you see social business. Of course, we think about social business, we think immediately two brands, Twitter and Facebook. There is a number of other things going on which can be segmented in some clusters, social advertising platform, social data, social shopping, social whatever, okay? And the trainee working for me said, Dr. Gendor, I'm gonna go, I said, hey, you did a very good job, okay? Very patient, all right, in uh, 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 raising this data and gathering all this information. I'm gonna give you another slide with the interconnections between all those things here. I said, please, don't do so. It's gonna be too much, okay, to interconnect all these things. In fact, this is part of one uh, research projects we are doing in the human systems arena, okay? Guys, um, for better or for worse, get used with the complexity and Mainly, find a way to approach it because it's going to be part of your days from now on, okay? Well, what has happened so far? Now I'm preparing to close, okay? Um, in the area of natural resources, we got the most compelling results, which was this project here in, in Rio de Janeiro. This project became as an incident management uh, solution, okay, right after a uh, disaster, the city got totally flooded, you see, do some heavy rains at the summertime with a mudslide from the hills, okay, uh, and, and, and the mayor said, I, I didn't even know what, uh, where should I go, if I should go to the city hall, if I should stay at home, if I should go uh, to, the, to the fluted area, if I should navigate in a helicopter, okay? So we decided to uh, uh, create a solution, and this solution started with one intention, but this intention, given the complexity of the situation, has unfolded to other areas, and I have no restrictions to say that the project that we have up there in Rio today is bigger by far than our first intention. What was our first intention? We uh, realized that you can count on satellite imagery uh, to do pretty precise weather forecasting. All, all right, based on um, satellite imagery, you can say where, when, and how much rain is gonna fall, fall, okay? This is plain vanilla. However, while the water is in the sky, and you can say when, where, and how much is gonna fall, you don't have a problem, okay? 
when you have the problem, when this water comes to soil. You see, that is exactly when your problem starts. You see, because now the water was in the sky, came to soil, and you have to figure out where this water is going to go, how it's going to flow. So you need to count on a pretty precise topographic map in the region where the rain uh, falls, okay? And in a city like Rio, which is bordering the sea, you need to couple, you see, this water flow to the tide height, okay? Because if the tide is too high, the water simply does not have where to flow, okay? So what we have made, first time ever, you see, in this planet, we made an integrated system which could integrate the regular weather forecast prediction, okay, with the city topography, depending on the water would fall, and then we connected that in an integrated fashion, real time, online, with the tide table, tide height table, all right? And uh, it was interesting be because we got to some conclusions. Uh, sometimes you have less water falling, you see? but it's going to be in a moment where the tide is too high. So a particular area such as this point here, this uh, uh, red dot here is going to be flooded, okay? Well, um, because of that, the city started installing cameras. Cameras became a very fashionable thing in the city. And today, city of Rio has this kind of operation center con uh, facility, okay? Which came to the first page of the New York Times. Um, in services, we have been doing a great job in controlling the quality of the services provided by IBM by doing something very human. We have down there one of those call centers to support our IT customers around the world. It's the second largest in IBM. First one is in Bangalore. I'm sure you guys called somebody, uh, some call center, and the person who attended you had Indian accent, this is pretty common here in the US, okay? Uh, in Brazil, we put a face in this, uh, in, in, in this interface. We put a human component in this interface. And this improved a lot the quality of our services, okay? Well, in microelectronics, we are trying to work with microfluidics to create an automated diagnosis tool to be used notably in the identification and treatment of dengue fever, okay? Uh, I've heard that some cases of dengue may have already happened here in the U.S. This is going to be an epidemic thing, okay? It's not a very deadly disease, but it's very impairing. And in human systems, we are working to improve accessibility, notably for visitors who will for sure show up in the big event. We are importing technology from our research center in Japan. Okay, we have installed communication towers here in the Copacabana Beach in Rio. Okay, in a way that a blind person can walk, you see, in the beach and get into verbal communication with some things. We are trying to humanize the Internet of the Things. Okay, hey chair, chair, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Uh, do you know chair, if there is something here I could uh, go to buy a beer? Wait a second. So the chair, which is a thing, get into communication with the rest of the system, okay? And comes back saying through the cell phone, you see, well, but it was a chair. Yes, but it was a chair humanizer. Thank you, chair. Bye now. Okay, so we are trying to do so because we will be doing something with a humane face, you see, and very workable and innovative. Maybe you're going to get into this project walk again, led by a Brazilian country fellow called Miguel Nicolelis working out of uh, Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Okay, we are still... Uh, checking what's going to happen. His intention is to have a paraplegic person performing the kickoff in the World Cup 
by using an exoskeleton. Skeleton. Future. Three minutes. Okay. Um, whenever we talk about technology, we need to talk a little bit about the future. And let me start by saying, or by asking, sir, do you have a drill at home? Yes. You do. How long do you have a drill? Ten years? Yes. Ten years. Do you remember how much did you pay? Because ten years ago, a drill was used to be expensive. All right. Let us say $100 or, or was it too much? Yeah, $100. Do you believe that you have already recovered your investment in whole? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Because you have this drill, you see, at least in a period of 10 years. If you buy drill today, it's going to take another 10 years for you to recover in whole the investment you have made in the drill. In fact, a person who acquires a drill does not want a drill. This person wants the hole. Okay? You don't want the product. You want the service. And this has been very properly put in written by Theodore Levitt from the Harvard Business School. All right? We are more and more dependent on services. You see, in the products are just to perform services. If you look at these statistics here, and this is American, the dedication, percentual dedication of the manpower since 1800 up to 2020, okay, the manpower back then was percentually mostly dedicated to agriculture, a little bit to industry, and a small percentage to service very primary services, okay? Butcher, bakery, things like that. As time goes on, agriculture lowering, industry at the Industrial Revolution time, a slight increase here, but services, okay, is the area where the increase is bigger. What we have now is the same problem here in service, the problem we have here in services is the same that this country had in agriculture back in 1800, okay? So we need to address this problem. By implementing a new area called SSME, Services Sciences Management and Engineering. This area is a brand new academic area, partially sponsored by by IBM, and I've been fortunate enough to see the inception of this area because at this time I was a visiting professor at the Berkeley University in California, UCB, okay, where most of these things uh, have happened. I cannot miss the opportunity to talk about services definition. What services? Okay, somebody said, well, Pretty much like pornography. We cannot define, but we can recognize when we see it. <laughs> okay, this is the statement by an American senator, okay, when he was asked about services. Well, we cannot recognize, but we can, uh, we cannot define, but we can recognize. Yes, we can define. Let's think about this bottle, okay? This bottle is a closed system, totally closed impermeable. I look at this bottle and I need something from this bottle. I need the value stored here, water. Why do I need it? For obvious reasons. I'm speaking a lot and I am thirsty. Thirsty? Dirty. <laughs> thirsty. Yeah, thank you. I'm a foreigner. <laughs> so I need a value here inside, okay? So what I'm going to do, this is a usable system, usable system. I am an eventual user. It has a value that I need because I'm thirsty. Okay, so I will engage the system to get this value. All right, so I open the system and get engaged on it to get this value. Wow. <laughs> well, 
At the moment I got engaged into this system to get this value, there was something alive here inside? I hope not. <laughs> OK. So a usable system with a value to which I get engaged and does not have anything alive on it, neither mimicking to be uh, an alive uh, body, this is a product. OK? This is a product. Now, when I get engaged into a system, all right, which has something alive inside it, this is a service. You see? Or somebody, some engine, some machine mimicking a human being. This is a service. We had to find a way to summarize all these concepts in the services sciences management and engineering. And the way we found was by borrowing the Intel logo to say a service system is something that has humans inside. All right? This is a real service system. I could stay here talking to you guys for another hour, but I cannot um, miss uh, the friendship of this big guy on my right, Tim. Thank you very much. Good luck. So now we know why he is the innovation evangelist. Passion <laughs> and energy and messages. Let's think back why we're here. Innovation is driven by the complex world. Sure. Right, he said, Outcomes, it's got to be in favor of humans. It's got to help us survive. Maybe world-changing solutions. It's got to make money. But he said, what did it, he also gave us, what does it require? Human relationships, T-shaped people, integrated and usable systems. So we know he's an evangelist. What I hope he'll call us one day, or continue to call us, is a good friend. Fabio, thank you very much. Thank you, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.